What is up, everyone? Welcome to episode six of Pog RX. I am your host, GamerDoc, and this is the only show on the internet that is going to make you a better video gamer and probably a better person. Today on the show, we're talking about travel. So the majority of gaming and esports competitions prior to COVID were land-based, meaning you had to show up in person to compete. Now, because of social distancing and thousands and thousands of people who who have COVID and refuse to wear masks, we still are kind of on online, but LAN events will return, they're starting to return. Um, and so you have to travel across the country and sometimes across the world to compete, especially when you get to the higher levels. And if you're playing Dota, you have to go to the international, right? If you're playing certain titles, you have to go to their one major competition. And oftentimes that means crossing a multitude of time zones, going into unfamiliar territories with unfamiliar foods. And if you're not paying attention to traveling intelligently, you can actually see lapses in your performance. Now, this is because of a variety of reasons. So anytime you're hopping on a plane, you are subjecting yourselves to the plane's environment. So you're higher up in the air, which means there's more atmospheric pressure. Um, the inside of the cabin is not as humid as the normal air. And what happens when air is not humid? Well, every time you breathe or talk, you're losing fluid. This is called insensible fluid losses. It's fluid loss that you can't prevent. It just, it just happens. Um, and with drier air, you're losing more fluid, so you're becoming more dehydrated. And now that's coupled with the fact that you don't want to drink water because you don't want to get up to go pee in the middle of the night on the plane. You're even more dehydrated. So you show up to your competition, you show up to the other side of the world, you're dehydrated. And then what happens? Jet lag sets in. Now, jet lag is one of those things where <clears throat> we talk about it, but we don't really know what it is. Like, if I were to ask you to define jet lag right now, you would probably say, oh, it's when you're tired when you travel across the country. Well, jet lag actually has a definition of it's a medical thing. Um, so what jet lag is when you cross time zones too rapidly for your body to adjust. Now, in order to understand jet lag, you need to understand your body's sleep-wake cycle. Everyone's heard of their circadian rhythm, but what does that mean? When the sun goes up, you're alert. When the sun goes down, you're not alert. Uh, and this actually comes from this tiny pea-sized structure in the back of your skull called your pineal gland. Um, and the pineal gland secretes a hormone called melatonin. Now, melatonin is super important. It's not only a strong antioxidant, but it also regulates this sleep-wake cycle. Not only does it do that, it regulates your body's temperature, your brainwave activity, other hormone production, cell regeneration, a bunch of important crap. Um, so you have your internal circadian rhythm, right? So for the past five, I've lived in DC for five years. I've lived in Eastern Standard Time my entire life. So my body knows around six in the morning, seven in the morning, the sun goes up. It's time to get up. The sun goes down between seven and 10, depending on what time of the year we are. And then it's time to go to bed. If I were to sit in complete darkness for 24, 36 hours, I still would feel sleepy at night. And that's because my body has regulated its own internal clock, right? It knows what time it is <clears throat> without light. It knows what time it is because it has this internal clock that's ticking, 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 ticking. Um, you know, at 10 by the time 10 o'clock hits, my body's like, where's my decaf time? Tea, it's time to get into my gym jams. It's time to go to sleep. So what happens if you fly east to the other side of the country and suddenly their 10 a.m. is your 10 p.m. And so when my body says it's time for gym jams, it's time for decaf tea, but it's sunny outside. That's what jet lag is. When your body's internal clock does not match the outside environmental cues. So this is more often when you travel eastward and jet lag symptoms are worse when you cross more than five time zones. And it sets in one to two days after you travel, okay? So the, the first thing that you're gonna notice is you're gonna feel more fatigued, but that's not where jet lag stops. It reduces your mental performance. It causes stomach issues, sleepiness, decreased motivation. In elite track and field athletes, this can turn into decrements in performance. It also can cause mood disorders, which is something that's kind of interesting that I wanna touch on in a couple of minutes. So jet lag, it will, interfere with your gaming if you're traveling for competitions, right? We said it decays mental performance. So how do you fix it? How do you fix jet lag? There's a bunch of studies out there on things that have been tried to circumvent jet lag. So even if you know you're traveling, you know you're not gonna get some time to wind down, how can you show up 
to that competition doing your best. And one of them is melatonin. So, you know, we said our body produces melatonin, but you can also take a pill of melatonin. Anytime you put a pill in your into your body, you want to talk to your doctor about it, whether or not it's a multivitamin or whatever it is. Taking exogenous, meaning a pill form of melatonin, can decrease jet lag symptoms. Um, it's one of the most effective things. Another thing is using an environmental cue or an external cue to reset your body's own internal clock. And I love this because it's called a Zeitgeiber, which is German for time giver. So a Zeitgeiber is a word that means an environmental cue that will help you adjust your circadian rhythm. Now, examples of Zeitgeibers are light, right? That makes sense. Um, meals, medication, temperature, exercise. These are all things that can help you reset your body's circadian rhythm. And this is something really cool that I want to talk about that doesn't, it's not really related to esports, but it's cool. So there's study out there that talk about the relationship between stressful life events and the development of depression, anxiety, and mood disorders. So let's say I live with a girlfriend and we have a dog together and we've been living our lives and we break up, right? So she takes the dog, leaves, and I get the apartment. Um, all of a sudden, I'm now sleeping in an empty bed. I'm going to bed at a different time because I'm not worried about her schedule. The dog's not waking me up in the morning because it has to pee. When I wake up in the morning, I'm not having a social interaction anymore. I'm not, you know, I'm not speaking to someone. Um, no one's making me breakfast. I have to make my own breakfast, right? So it, it's throwing off your schedule. Now, the more your social life and your social schedule is thrown off by a traumatic event, the more likely you are to develop depressive symptoms. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So these zeitgeibers, these external cues, set everything in your life. Um, and so when you get thrown off your schedule, you can develop mood disorders. Like that's how important this stuff is, right? That's how important this stuff is. But if you if you were to Google esports travel, healthy esports travel habits, what would show up? Do it. I have no idea. Probably nothing. Probably this podcast. Welcome to the podcast. So how do you synchronize your zeitgeibers to avoid jet lag? One of the things is you want, you know, if you go to a new time zone, staying awake until it's dark outside, right? You, you want to go there, you want to crash. If you're going to do that, take like a 45 minute nap. But um, you're staying awake until the sun goes down in the time zone of your destination, um, avoiding bright lights in the morning, but then in the afternoon, getting as much natural sunlight as possible in your destination. Those help you increase your body's own production of melatonin to reset that internal clock and avoid jet lag. What else can help jet lag? So some studies show that 300 milligrams of caffeine taken at 8 a.m. in the time zone of your destination can decrease symptoms of jet lag. Food composition, a high fat diet might actually increase the quality of your sleep. So why is that? It's because the building blocks of fat, fatty acids, are involved in the production of, you've guessed it, melatonin. So where does melatonin come from? Has anyone ever heard the myth of turkey making you sleepy on Thanksgiving day? Everyone's like, you're tired after that big meal and you're like, oh, it's the tryptophan in the turkey. So tryptophan is an amino acid that gets transformed into serotonin, which is a compound that makes you happy. Serotonin then gets transformed into melatonin. So tryptophan is actually a component of melatonin. Is that the reason why you're sleepy on Thanksgiving? Absolutely not. The reason why you're sleepy on Thanksgiving is because you've been drinking all day, your football team just lost, you ate a giant 5,000 calorie meal at like 4 p.m. in the afternoon, and all the blood flow is suddenly shifted from your brain to your stomach. The tryptophan in turkey is not what's causing you to be sleepy on Thanksgiving. It's all of the other factors. But if you're traveling and you have a high fat diet, um, this might actually help you sleep better at night. There's some evidence that shows that, especially if you're jet lagged. I know I, I just threw a lot of science at people and ruined their Thanksgiving Day stories, but so if you are going to be traveling for esports competitions, here's what I want you to do. This is not medical advice. This is for educational purposes only. Bring a water bottle. Bring a reusable water bottle and drink it. Fill it up and drink it. So easy. So easy. Avoid dehydration. We're all dehydrated. We're all walking around dehydrated especially when traveling. Bring a water bottle, drink it. Caffeine in the morning, melatonin at night. Not medical advice. Eat some fiber. If you don't poop for four days, you're gonna feel like crap. No pun intended. You need to poop to be happy. And if you're nervous and you're constipated, you're not gonna feel great. It's gonna make you 
feel uncomfortable. If this is a chronic problem for you and things like prunes don't help you or high fiber foods don't help you, talk to your doctor about a stool softener. Your gut is so heavily tied to your brain and your performance that if you are constantly experiencing constipation on travel, a stool softener might be the right choice to you. So talk to your doctor. Wash your hands. So <clears throat> you know what grosses me out? Norovirus. So I hiked the Appalachian Trail the summer between med school and interim year, and everyone on the trail got norovirus except for me, thank God. And I learned a lot about norovirus after that. I learned a lot more in med school. Norovirus is the infamous like cruise ship bug. You know how like an entire cruise ship will get diarrhea? Well, it's norovirus. Like I think it happened to a Caribbean cruise like two years ago. You know how you get norovirus? It doesn't get transmitted through coughing. It doesn't get transmitted through droplets. Norovirus only gets transmitted through microscopic particles of poop. Think about that. Think about that. Think about how you get norovirus. So someone goes to the bathroom, right, in your airplane cabin, in your hotel room. They don't wash their hands. They grab the handle and they leave. It doesn't matter if you wash your hands after you go to the bathroom because you're touching that handle. So when you're traveling, this is this is a tip my grandma taught me when I was a very young kid. When you're when you're using the bathroom in a public place, wash your hands, keep the paper towel in your hand and open the door. Right? Or just have some hand sanitizer on hand and wash your hands after you get out because you know what's going to ruin your esports performance? Norovirus. So those are my top tips. I know I just threw a lot at you guys. But these are the things you, you got to know. you got to know these things if you're going to be traveling, especially for competitions, especially for gaming, or even if for other reasons, you know, because no one wants norovirus. So there you have it, the, the basics of jet lag, my top tips for traveling, for esports, for competitions, for really anything, because no one wants norovirus. We have a fantastic guest on the podcast this for the second half, Miss Harvey, which I'm super excited about. But first we have our Pog RX. Finding the right exercise and strength training program for esports can be difficult because is it going to benefit you in Valorant if you get huge biceps? Probably not, but that effective exercise might. So what do you want to work on for specific strength training? Now the fingers in the hand are something that's really important because by strengthening your tendons and the muscles in your hand, you're not only allowing yourself to click faster, more efficiently, but you're going to prevent injuries down the road. So in order to do this, in order to strengthen these muscles, all you need is a rubber band, a hair tie, something elastic you can wrap around your fingers. What you're going to do is you're going to take a rubber band, you're going to wrap it around all four of your fingers with your hand and all your fingers pushed together. It's like you're trying to rubber band a bunch of straws together, but the straws are your fingers. So what you're going to do is you're going to take that and you're going to extend the fingers backwards as far as you can and come back to neutral. Extend the fingers backwards, come back to neutral. You can do these with all of your fingers. You can do them with three of your fingers, two of your fingers. It's a great exercise to do while you're just sitting there in between games, you're studying, you're watching TV. Try this for like a minute or two and see how you feel the burn. If you work on this over time, you're definitely gonna see some improvement. So there you go, your Pogar expert today. When you think about something like holding a rubber band in your hand and doing silly little exercises, that might seem dumb to you. Some of these things might seem like they're not gonna have a big change. Like what is staring at a wall for 20 seconds gonna do for you? What is holding a rubber band in your hand gonna do for you? And the fact of the matter is it's actually gonna do a lot. Little incremental habit changes, lifestyle changes, have the most profound effect. Way more than any stupid fad diet that's based on erroneous, erroneous science. You know, like if you're doing these little things as opposed to trying to go keto or trying to fast, you're going to see a bigger effect because it's going to be sustainable. You're not going to give up on it in a couple of weeks. So I want you to try these little things and I promise you, you're going to see improvements. Speaking of improvements, our guest today, I'm someone I'm so excited about. We have Miss Harvey. Miss Harvey is a five-time world champion. She has made her mark in the Counter-Strike scene before moving on to be the director of development at CLG. Everyone who is in the CSGO scene has heard her name and most people in esports have. So I am just so overjoyed to welcome Miss Harvey to our show. Miss Harvey, welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. You're kind of a big deal, so thanks for finding the time to, to join us. 
Hi, it was my pleasure. You're so awesome. Oh my God, I love you. Okay, so <laughs> I know everything about you already, but I checked your Wikipedia page because I'm a good investigatory journalist. Um, and the first time you played competitively, it listed in like 2005 for the Czech Six Divas. Um, so then you went from there, you went to the SK Ladies, then to UB Knighted, then CLG Red. So at what point, did I say UB Knighted? At what point did it feel like you were just kind of like playing video games to playing professional esports. Well, I, you know what? Even when I was playing for Check Six uh, in 05, it, it feels semi pro. Um, it felt semi pro because there was nothing else that was bigger than that, right? So you were traveling and you were not being paid yet, but you were trying to win money. And you were sponsored, uh, you know, your hotel was paid and whatnot. And I was almost. Uh, as big as you could get. There were a couple of players who were salaried on teams, but in 05, it was very, very limited. So I would say back then, it, it nice. felt that it was pro gaming, right? Or at least as close as possible. Um, and especially when I got signed on SK Gaming, that felt like really real. So that happened at the end of 2005. So I would say just then. See, I think that the difference is that in the early 2010s like maybe 2012 and 13 um then there was so much money to be made from streaming and twitch that i had the chance to go full-time doing that while competing i didn't then i stayed at ubisoft um and then it kind of became real when i left ubisoft around 2016 then i was salaried so my official salaried moments started in 2016 but so five years ago wow it feels like 20 years ago to be honest um but um it it for me it felt like i was always a pro gamer i was kind of following the wave where pro gaming was yeah and i mean 2020 counts as 10 years so it was like 15 years ago so you're fine um <laughs> what so what was esports like in 2005 because you know a lot of us have really been paying attention to the competitive video game scene for the past five years maybe some of us 10 years but that mm. was like 16 years ago so what was esports like back then? Yeah, so actually, I started competing internationally in 05, but I wow. my first tournaments were in 03, right? So uh, back then, mainly esports was local. Mm -hmm. um, you had like one international event throughout the year and you had to not miss it, right? Everything else was pretty much local. There was like uh, tournaments all across North America and the US and Canada and whatnot. And they were all in, in land and, um, in a LAN environment. So it was, mm -hmm. everything was pretty much bring your own computer. If you had computers there to compete, that was like a tier one tournament like where that. you didn't have to bring your computer, right? Uh, so from um, from your local like church area with 300, 300 people like, kind of gathering to uh, a bigger one, maybe like going to Texas for, for one of the CPLs at the time, um, it, was, it was very local. So everybody, either slept at the computers mm -hmm. or had the hotel really close. But for my first two years, I slept at the computers. I was a teenager. I didn't have the money to pay for hotel rooms, right? <laughs> you slept at the computer? Yeah, 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 for that. Oh, like underneath your, your computer at the chair or whatnot. Uh, that, was, that, was the, that was the way you land back then. You, we didn't wild. have hotels. Yeah. <laughs> that is absolutely wild. Okay, so when did you get to start you know, not sleeping underneath a desk? Um, well, if you had a local land, mm -hmm, you could go yeah. back home. So right. that was, you were lucky. You were like, oh my God, you're like 20 minutes away, driving distance, that's great, you can go home. Um, or my first tournament, I went to a tournament in New York City mm -hmm. in 2005, and then we had to, obviously we had to uh, get an hotel there because there was no, way to sleep under the computers yeah. so uh that was my first time and we had to split wow. pretty much at the cost for that that's wild I, I i hope there are pictures somewhere of you sleeping underneath uh like it just like ju like juxtapositioned with you now that would just be really cool <laughs> you know what like if it was nowadays it would be easy to take a picture but back then that's it was true you, you know <laughs> It was like old school pictures. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You had to develop and everything. So. Camera. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, no, I don't I don't think anybody took a picture of me sleeping on the ground. Oh my god. <laughs> I know we're the same age, so this is funny. Um so okay, so 
early esports for you was a little bit different than for CLG Red. You're traveling, you're you know, you're sponsored, you're traveling more international, you're you're staying in hotels. Um, what was the travel schedule like? So if you had a tournament <clears throat> on a Monday, would you guys get there Monday morning? Would you get there Sunday night? What was the like the travel schedule like? Mm -hmm. So in if a tournament was in America, we would travel the day before. Mm -hmm. um, there was no uh, media days then. So it, it was like you get there the day before and if you miss your flight, if something happens, well, you're doomed. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was pretty much the same thing uh, when you traveled in, on the European side. But the difference is that you would get there around noon, one, uh, you know, because of the you would fly overnight. Um, so you kind of skip tonight and oh usually you either add the media day then or you were competing the next day. Um, or yeah, so it was really intense. If anything happened on the travel schedule, you were pretty much F. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, most of the times we got to get our badges, you know, the, the, day, uh, the day that we land and whatnot. But uh, we had more energy than I do now. Now right. I, like, I'm, a, I'm a different human. Now I, I, I travel tight like that because I have such a busy schedule. Um, but back then, we didn't have a busy schedule. It was because we didn't want to pay for the extra hotel <laughs> night. So. Oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, yeah, now you like, you have to go in at a certain time to leave because you're working up until the day before and you have like seven different exactly. experiences. Yeah. So did you ever notice a difference? So, you know, the, we, we talked in the intro about jet lag and how it affects your performance. You know, there's all these studies about how jet lag does affect your performance and how traveling. So you're, you're sleeping or you're traveling on a bus, or you're traveling on a plane, you're sleeping in uncomfortable positions, you're missing nights of sleep. Did you notice a difference in your performance? Did you notice a difference? Or did you have any things you did to kind of counteract those effects? Were you like chugging Red Bull or what? Yeah, so uh, the fun thing is that most of our career in America, we traveled to the to Europe to compete. So we were always jet lag and they were mm -hmm. never jet lag, oh. right? So we, we, we have days where we're like, one day we'll have an, an American tournament and we'll be the one with no jet lag, right? But it happened like twice. Uh, it happened in 2008 and 2015. Other than that, it was always in, in Europe, right? Um, so for me, uh, I was the worst on the team. I need a lot of sleep. Mm -hmm. I need like nine, 10 hours of sleep a day. Like it's it's, it's actually a problem even today. Uh, I'm always tired. So for the, the jet lag is really hard for me. Um, I would go to bed super early, like 7, 8 p.m. and, and you know, sleep the whole night. And, and it's always been pretty difficult. I'm someone that doesn't drink coffee or energy drinks too, so it was really challenging. I would use tea a lot. I would um, uh, I would do my best. I was young and I would kind of suck it up. And yeah. to be honest, it was okay until we had really long days. So if you, if you just come in for one game, it's like two, three hours, uh, and then you're out, then those were fine. But there were tournaments where we would get there at, you know, our first games at 11, so you get there at 9. That means you wake up at 7. Um, and from 11 until 11 p.m., you compete. And that's when I had my biggest issues. I would definitely crash at some point during the day, sleep on the floor with my with my sleeping mask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it would annoy the hell out of my teammates. But, it, like... You know, there's not nothing else I can do. I'm so tired um, that that's how I would handle it. I mean, naps are legit. You know, you're trying to get in that, that little wink of sleep. You know, yep. REM sleep is where you recover cognitively. And so you're getting in a little nap. You're, that's why that's why you're a god at gaming, I guess, is because you sleep so much, right? Must be. <laughs> not all the practice or no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, it's because I sleep a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I, you know, on the Wikipedia page, there's all these cool facts about you. But one is that you were the first, on the first all-women's team to have a gaming house. Did you live in the gaming house? Yeah, we did. We lived in the CLG Red House for two years. Uh, I can't recall if there's any other women that have a gaming house. Maybe the Genji girls recently yeah. uh, got a house. But other than that, I really can't recall. Uh, so that was always like a dream for me to be in a house. For and, sure. Um, when I got my sabbatical from Ubisoft, I was like, okay, I'm moving to LA. Let's just do it. Right. Uh, and we all decided to do it. So at the same time, we all moved in um, near the compound at CLG. And 
turns out they helped us like with everything at first it was just like we'll help you and then they became like official thing yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like because we were we were part of the that all the houses that clg had and so it was it was it was both good and bad i think i didn't know what to expect i thought it was going to be like life-changing and i and i um i didn't handle it the best way that i could we had no experience no one told us what to do and i think i got lost in the house i started gaming less because I, I i i'm a very um solo human i love my my alone time so i would go back to my room or i would go to the gym and i ended up like trying kind of trying to escape outside of practice instead of practicing more um on my free time which is what i was doing when i was home like i would practice outside of practice uh but in the house practice was in the main room which was where everybody was and i always needed to kind of escape and, and so that was like my biggest issue i think and also like uh conflicts within the house would sometimes interfere in the game so that was also very interesting but i think my main issue is myself you know what i could have done better we co all could have done better things but it's 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 just way easier looking back and thinking oh my priorities yeah. might not have been at the right place at the right time um so that, yeah that's also why it's so good that you know you, you stuck around at clg and now you're the director of development you know, you don't know any better when you're 19, 20, 21, 22 years old. You just move into a gaming house. It's awesome. It's your dream. I know you're a little bit older than that. But, you know, now you, with that hindsight, can take those things you learned and, you know, help CLG with with their development, with these things like that. So what like what are some things that if you went back, how would you have made that situation healthier for everyone if you were, like, in a decision-making capacity? Um... That's a very good point. I think having a neutral person at all times, not living in the house, uh, probably would have helped. We had neutral people, but one of them, she was living in the house too, and she oh. was heavily emotionally connected to everyone, so yeah. she was kind of part of the whole issue. Uh, what, like, I mean, she wasn't creating any issue, but um, right. it's just, right. you know. They're in the environment. She wasn't detached enough. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then sometimes we had coaches, but not as, not included in the house like I want like it would have been mm -hmm. uh, i think essential so uh probably that um that would have made it better also uh, at the time we didn't have a player development coach yeah. right um i think that would have made a huge difference yeah, to be totally. able to to uh grow as a human and understand that you know like is this is this how you want to handle things like you know uh that would have been really important and 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 obviously, I think having uh, more guides, uh, yeah, overall like a, a better guiding light, I think, yeah, what we want to do. But it was so it was esports. It's funny how fast esports evolves, right? That was like five years ago. And it feels like a million years because esports evolved like crazy since then. If I were to do it again, it's really having offices to work and then individual apartments. Yeah, uh, obviously, some kids are a little bit younger. Uh, so maybe being paired, you know, with a roommate mm -hmm. and something like that. But uh, I really think that privacy is really important, not just for uh, the cohesion of the team, right? Yeah. And be able to cool off if there's anything going on, but also just for an the independency of these players so that they can grow and that they can become, uh, you know, humans yeah. and that can be independent once that they're not in the gaming house anymore when they're 26, 27, 28 just something that it was a little difficult to to learn um not necessarily for me but i'm looking at other kids you yeah. know all their food everything was done and they pretty much didn't have to do anything um they didn't buy furniture they just had like a mattress on the floor and they were okay with that you know and and i think that's that can last for a bit but probably it would be great if we could teach yeah. Uh, and educate a little bit better. Yeah, I think it's definitely going to continue to grow and change and evolve as more people who were formal, former players are going into leadership positions, but also people from other industries are coming in and being in leadership positions and, yeah. and taking their knowledge from other things and applying it and seeing if it works. Um, so, Miss Harvey, we are almost out of time. So one, so fast. I know, right? I know. Well, well, we have to, we have to, you know, prescribe to the millennial and Gen Z attention span. So, oh, that's you know. true. That's true. That's true. Okay. Uh, so, last question: If you were to give someone 
one tip, one piece of advice that you would want, that you would want to know in 2003, 2004, 2005, that would make them a better video gamer, that would make them better at esports, what would it be? You could only pick one. Okay. Yes. Priorities, because I can twist it. It would just be one advice. Uh, so I think it's priorities because so many things happen in your life and sometimes you lose track of what's important and what's not. And then sometimes, you know, you can get benched or your game does not become popular anymore. You never make it to pro. And, and, and all of that really doesn't matter if you sit down and look back at what you want to do. And if your goal is to become a professional gamer, all of these other variables are, are irrelevant to your own journey and your own progression. And that's what you need to keep looking at and keep thinking about. And in the end, if you... If you have that little journey of your priorities and you, you focus on them, whatever, if it's like a relationship, uh, friendship, you know, family, uh, education, and, and, and competing, everything else that comes in the way, you'll never lose your, kind of your north star and you'll be able to, to eventually get a yes or eventually get a contract or get paid to do something and then, you know, be able to continue throughout that journey without being... Uh, discourage. Yeah, say. totally. I love that. I love. I, I think that's that's good for people who aren't even in gaming and esports. It's it's like, what do you really want out of life? What do you really want to do? And don't forget that because things can be super distracting, and, and good opportunities mm -hmm. might seem like good opportunities, but are they are they aligned with your priorities? So I love that advice. Exactly. I love it. Exactly. I think I got lost a couple of times in my life, so who, I mean, always my favorite advice. That's that's the best because when you find your way back to the path. That's when you really strengthen those priorities, right? Yeah. Um, okay, well, you are fantastic and wonderful. Your Twitter username has been below you this whole time, so if oh. you weren't all already following Miss Harvey, we'll do it right now. But where else do you want people to find you or any, any special projects or things uh, or maybe, like, any awesome clothing brands that you know? <laughs> yeah, I'm always working on Elevate stuff behind the scene. You're one of my favorite customers because you always – you always say how cool the, the shirt was. It's the best shirt. Um, it's the best shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm a little bit everywhere. I'm trying to do more TikToks, but it's at Miss RV. I'm obviously streaming all the time at Miss RV. So it's coming out. Um, I love talking with everybody, either on um, stream or on my Discord. So uh, welcome to chat and hang out with me. Well, all right. I mean, I'm sure everyone's going to go do that. And everyone's going to go buy your Pew Pew shirt because it's it's <laughs> comfortable. It's trendy. It's awesome. It's nerdy. Like, it's the perfect shirt. So everyone go buy the shirt and we can all match. Um, Miss Harvey, thank you so much for coming on the show. You are fantastic. Keep crushing. All right, y'all. Miss Harvey wants you to set your priorities. And she's a world champion. So if you want to be a world champion, I don't know, maybe listen to her. Things like that, things like setting goals, setting priorities, taking time to be mindful, those are the little things. Those are the little things. We all think that there's some sort of secret key to success or there's a secret key to making it big. You need all this luck. But in actuality, it's about doing the right things over and over and over again that aren't flashy, that aren't going to make a big deal in the, in the media. You're not gonna be able to make a TikTok about setting your priorities. But that's the stuff that leads you to success. You got to do the work if you want to reap the benefits. That is it. That is our episode, ladies and gentlemen. If you haven't seen the other ones, make sure you go back and check it out. I am your host, Gamer Doc. This has been another episode of PogRx. Have a happy and a healthy week. Thanks for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this show. For more information, follow GamerDoc on Twitter at GamerDoc underscore. And please remember, nothing in this video is medical advice. Yes, I am a doctor, and yes, you may need help. But this is the internet, and this is for entertainment informational purposes only. Thank you, and have a very nice day.